All right, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 12. John 12 is our text this morning. If you're new, um, we like to go through books of the Bible here at Loft. We just study chapter by chapter, section by section, and just study what God is teaching us. And so we are um, in a long series in the Gospel of John. And this morning we're at John 12. We're going to be looking at verses 12 down to verse 26. John 12 down to 26. And as we've been studying John, we've been specifically looking at what does this passage teach us about Jesus. What does this passage communicate to us about the character, the trait, the personality, um, the person of Jesus? And so we've been discovering in each of these sections that this is what this text communicates to us about who Jesus is. And this morning what we're going to discover in our text is that Jesus is king. Jesus is king. That he is our king and that he still reigns. And we're going to discover the type of king that Jesus is. You know, there are monarchies as one of the oldest forms of government in the history of the world. Until 1800, most of the world ran by this sort of government. In fact, there are still 45 countries today that are still monarchies run by a king, run by a queen, including 16 countries that consider the Queen of England as their queen. And typically, this will involve a king or a queen who had absolute power, and though sometimes they were more like puppet kings, like the Queen of England is now. Um, Some or the most infamous kings or queens in history included King Solomon of Israel, King Xerxes of Persia, King Alexander the Great of Macedonia, King Tut of Egypt, Caesar Augustine of Rome, King Henry VIII of England, famous kings that have gone before us. Now these kings, for the most part, shared certain characteristics, certain qualities about them. They all had a certain M.O., For one, most of them, for the most part, they were proud. They were pompous. And that was because if these kings showed any signs of weakness, more than likely a coup would be formed and they would be overthrown. And thus they made every effort to stomp out any threat to their kingdom. We see this in King Herod in the Bible in Matthew when he heard that a king was born in Bethlehem, that Herod went and killed every male child under the age of two in the region of Bethlehem. We also see this in uh, another King Herod in the book of Acts, who had killed James, the apostle. He gave a speech, and everyone heralded him as the voice of God and not a man, and he received it, and God struck him dead in an instant. These kings were proud, they were pompous, but they were also inaccessible. It was very hard to get um, a I stand before the king. It was very hard to be able to go and just talk to the king. You couldn't just walk up to a king and have a conversation with them. You had to be invited into the king's court. And even then, you had to be careful of what you said because if you said something that the king didn't like, you could be struck dead in an instant. I don't know if you remember the story of Esther in the Old Testament. Esther is the wife of the king, and she had to risk her own life going, stand before the king without being invited, even though she was the queen, the wife. Kings were pompous, they were proud, they were inaccessible, but they were also vicious. For the most part, these kings that I mentioned earlier, for the most part, they were vicious. They were known to destroy enemies, to even destroy their own people. Many times, kings, the only thing they cared about was their own good. They only cared about what was good for them, and they would even kill their own people to keep their position. Athaliah was called the wicked woman in Second Chronicles. She took over as queen when her son passed away, and she did what every grandmother would do. She had her entire family killed when she became queen, just to make sure none of her family would try to take the throne from her. She, um, Herod, the one that talked about the baby, had all the babies killed, he also had all of his sons killed one day because he thought his sons were going to try to take the throne away from him. They were proud, they were pompous, they were inaccessible, they were vicious people. And so when we pick up our story here in John 12, we need to note that this is the MO of every king in that culture of that day. And if someone was going to be king, 
You wanted to be on their side. You wanted to be friends with them. You wanted to be their buddies, rub shoulders with them, kiss up to them, be on their campaign trail, because you knew the only thing they were going to exalt was themselves, and if you weren't on their side, they would crush you, so you did everything possible to be on their good side. And yet when you'd see Jesus we find a very unusual king. A king that doesn't fit into the paradigm of these other kings. He was a humble king instead of a proud and pompous king. He was accessible. We were welcomed into his presence instead of being inaccessible. And he was a savior king instead of being a vicious king. And so this morning we're going to discover in our text the type of king that Jesus is. And the first thing I want you to notice is that Jesus was a humble king. He was humble. Look at verse 12, John 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So this, friends, this is the last week of Jesus' life. In literally a week, he'll be hanging dead on the cross. The Passover celebration is happening in Jerusalem, and rumors about Jesus is flying everywhere in the city. TMC has gotten hold of rumors about Jesus, and it's all over Jerusalem Times. It's just going nuts, and everyone wants to know about Jesus. Everyone is asking questions. Crowds are gathering everywhere, and the conversation in every crowd, in every conversation is, Jesus, what do we make of Jesus? And this was a large crowd. According to Josephus, a Jewish historian, during this time, it was maybe about 2.7 million people that were gathering in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And looking at the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find out some other details to this story. We find out that as Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, he has a crowd with him as well. He has healed three blind men, including Bartimaeus, who now, Bartimaeus, has joined the disciples and the rest of the people at the house party that we looked at last week at Simon's house. And that means Jesus' entourage now includes three former blind people, three, uh, a former leper, and a former dead man, along with his dazed and confused disciples who have no idea what to make of Jesus. And now as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he's not coming to Jerusalem as some last-ditch political effort to make himself king even though that's what the crowd thought, that people thought that Jesus was coming now to take over. This is why when you read this passage, they created this party atmosphere because they thought this was how the king was going to be introduced in that culture, that he would ride into a town publicly and be hailed by cheering crowds. They understood this from the Old Testament. The prophet Zechariah would say it this way in Zechariah 9. He would say, rejoice, rejoice. O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So they were expecting this. They were expecting Jesus to come in as a king. They had heard about this prophecy, and they thought this was the time. Verse 13 of John 12 says, we see how the people responded. So they took branches of palm trees, they went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Mark tells us that the scene is like a parade. There's people before Jesus. There's people after Jesus. And there's just shouting. There's celebration. This is um, Philadelphia after the Eagles won a Super Bowl parade um, on steroids. They're going nuts right now. And they're thinking that Jesus has come to deliver them from Rome. Matthew tells us that the people took their coats, their jackets, and they laid it on the floors, and others took their branches and put them on the road where the donkey went to, and others would just take their branches and wave them just, they, just like they didn't care at all, and they were just going insane because they thought victory had finally come. You've got to ask some questions. Why palm branches? Why are they celebrating with palms here? See, palms in those times were used to symbolize victory. This is why in the ancient Greek games... When someone won, they were given a palm branch to hold. And when they were, then during the ceremony, they would give their palm branch to, to, the, um, to the person in exchange for a crown. This is why Nike, the Greek goddess of victory, not Yeshu, um, is always symbolized as holding palm branches. And we also see them persistently shouting things like, Hosanna, Hosanna, which 
is the equivalent to the modern English phrase of God saved the king. They were also quoting passages from like Psalm 118, a messianic psalm, a conquering psalm, by saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were singing in anticipation of a Messiah who would come and deliver them from Rome. That's what they thought was going to happen. The crowds had their trumpets ready to ring out at any time. They thought the call was going to be made in a heartbeat for them to get ready to fight. They no doubt were sharpening their swords and preparing for battle. They thought this was it. And listen, the people were not confused. They knew exactly what they were saying. They were sure that this is how Jesus was going to clean house and wipe away those blasted Romans forever. And they just saw that Jesus had the power to do so. Just a few days ago, he raised a dead man from the de a dead man and brought him back to life. If he had the power over death, which is clearly more powerful than Rome, defeating Rome was a piece of cake. And on their minds, they thought, this is it. Jesus is now coming in. We're going to be victorious. Rome is going to be destroyed. And you can imagine the buzz, the excitement, and the cheer getting louder and louder as Jesus entered the city. They're ready to bust into this insurrectionist frenzy like sharks at the sight of blood. And they would see the top of his head pop up and down in the crowd ever so slightly as he slowly moved forward. And it seemed strange to the crowd that Jesus is sitting so low and as they got closer to him, they peeked through the crowd and they saw that probably took something out of the air of their excitement. Because instead of Jesus riding on a white horse with a robe, with a sword in his hand, Jesus is riding on a donkey. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it. What was Jesus doing on a donkey? That's not the king we were expecting. That's not... Riding in victorious, only day laborers would ride into a donkey on a donkey. Poor people or a peasant king who was coming into enemy territory surrendering would ride on a donkey. And they didn't want a peasant king. They didn't want a hobbit. They didn't want a defeated king. They wanted a conquering king. And now, how Jesus chose this donkey is interesting. The other gospel tells us that Jesus must have sensed the excitement of the crowd and he took this opportunity for one last time to show his disciples who he was and what he was about. So as the disciples came to the Mount of Olives, Jesus takes two of his disciples and says, hey, go into that town and here's what's going to happen. You're going to go into that town. You're going to see two donkeys. You're going to untie them and bring them and the owners are going to ask you and just say, I told you this and I told you I need them and the owners are going to give it. And that's exactly what happens. And Jesus demonstrates that he knows everything in our future. Go down to verse 15 to his prophecy. He says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered, then they remembered that these things had been written about him. The quote there begins with, Fear not. That wasn't in the original text from Zechariah. It was drawn later from Isaiah. And why does John add that phrase, fear not? Because I think at this moment, the people were afraid of losing everything. Even the disciples didn't fully understand why Jesus was on a donkey instead of a horse. Even the disciples were afraid that everything that they worked for, everything that they had given up over the last three years, all the sacrifices that they had offered up would be in vain. They didn't serve God and follow God and pursue Jesus and give up everything that they owned to follow a weak Messiah who wasn't going to deliver them. They thought they were pursuing Jesus, and when they pursued Jesus, that he was going to overtake Rome and he was going to be king, and they were going to be Jesus' right-hand people. They weren't expecting Jesus on a donkey. But what they didn't understand was that Jesus' weakness was about to become their strength against their greatest enemy, and Rome wasn't their greatest enemy. He wasn't going to conquer Rome because conquering Rome would have been just too easy for Jesus. All he would have to do is say the word, and Rome would be destroyed, but to conquer sin and death and hell and Satan, that was a whole different ballgame, a whole different battle, and that battle would cost Jesus his life. As a matter of fact, two verses later in Zechariah 9, we read these verses in Zechariah 9 and 11. He says, As for you also, 
Because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pits. Zechariah prophesies that it's because of the blood of Jesus that you and I will be set free. His weakness becomes our strength. His defeat, so, so to say, becomes our greatest victory. Go back to verse 17. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. See, after all of this is over, the people scatter throughout the entire city talking about Jesus and Lazarus. They no doubt are confused and whipped up into this emotional frenzy that they disregard Jesus' presentation as a humble servant. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. The Pharisees now are pointing fingers at each other. Luke says they got so bold, they went to confront Jesus and say, tell Jesus, Listen, Jesus, tell this crowd to shut up. And Jesus responds, if I tell these people to shut up, then the rocks are going to sing out. You see, Jesus was a king. He didn't ever deny the fact that he was king. He never said, don't call me a king. He acknowledged his kingship. He was all that they had proclaimed him to be. But the fact that he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey tells us something else about Jesus. He was a humble king. He was different from any other king that had gone before him or after him. Jesus doesn't lay aside his deity, but he humbles himself to become a man and die. Listen, he had every right and every ability to crush everyone, but he knew that wouldn't maximize his glory and our joy, and so he dies in their place instead. Look at this passage in Philippians. It says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be grasped, to be a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. Taking a form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Listen, if Jesus had been everything that the crowd wanted, then they would have received what they didn't want. He would have come and he could have conquered and he could have delivered them from Rome. And in doing so, he could have saved their lives for a few short years, but they would have been lost forever. He could have, he could have overthrown Rome and sat on the throne, but when they died, they still would have been lost. But Jesus came to rescue them permanently. And he had to humble himself in order to do so. He deliberately departed from the script that the disciples and the crowd and our people were writing. They were trying to write for him, and he wrote his own death into the story. 2 Corinthians says it this way, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that even though he was rich, yet for your sake, for my sake, he became poor, so that you and I, by his poverty, we can become rich. Jesus was a humble king. Number two, Jesus was an accessible king. You had access to Jesus. See, in those days, even in today's modern day, the strength of a king or a leader or a president was found in the number of servants or people who would protect him and keep anyone from getting near him. But Jesus was altogether a completely different king. John 12, 20. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. And so these Greeks came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. And Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Here we find another unique, a story that's unique to the Gospel of John. We find out there's some Greeks that are in Jerusalem that wanted to see Jesus. These guys were potential converts to Judaism, and they were seeking God. They were looking for God And yet everything about the current state of Judaism discouraged them from from pursuing God, discouraged them from converting to Judaism. The Jews had no respect for them. The Jews would call them dogs, which was a racist slang. They were ripped off at the sales of animals at the temple, and even in the great temple, they were pushed to the fringes. 
They were only allowed in the outskirts of the temple, and they were left to be like little kids peeking through holes to see what all the commotion and the excitement that was happening. And the gospel thus kept them in the Judaism. The gospel was thus kept from them in the Judaism of the day. In fact, at the temple, there was this five-foot barricade around the temple proper. And on that barricade, it had these words inscribed on it that no foreigner is allowed to enter within the gate of the sanctuary, that whoever is caught will have himself to blame for the death that follows. This is not a sign that says trespassers will be prosecuted. This is saying trespassers will be shot and killed. Just like little children, just like the little children that they tried to keep away from Jesus, a passage that Christine read this morning, these people try to keep the Greeks away from God. But Jesus welcomes the Greek. He says, you're welcome into my presence. And the result of this request, the result of this reception, is that we see the plan of God is so much greater than just for the people of Israel. That the plan of God included people like you and me. It was for the whole world. The church was on the brink of coming into existence where everyone would be welcome into God's family and all of us can say that we are a son of God or a daughter of God. The church would include people like the Philippian, like the Philippian church in Acts 16 that had a white-collared businesswoman, a marginalized girl, a blue-collar Roman jailer, all of which were outcasts to Judaism. And Jesus would reach people from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation because he broke down the wall so that any one of us can come into his presence through faith in Jesus, not through a system, not through religion, not through a location, not through what we do or what we own, but simply because his blood has allowed us free access into the throne of grace. Listen to these words in Ephesians. He says, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in, him, create in himself one new man in the place of two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing all hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near, so that through him we both have access to, in one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Because of Jesus, we're all welcome. We all have a seat at the table. My favorite example of this is a story that's found in Matthew 8. The context of Matthew 8 is very similar to what's going on now. Jesus had just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and the crowds were in a frenzy because they were like, no one's ever taught like this. And so Jesus goes, walks down this mountain, and there's a crowd there. And you could see the crowd is loud and noisy, and all of a sudden it gets quiet because this leper begins to walk in the middle of the crowd, and the crowd begins to part because no one wants to touch this leper. And the poor leper hobbling along gets in front of Jesus and he falls in front of Jesus. Suddenly everyone is quiet. The music stops. Everyone is gasping. And you can see some people on the side yelling at the leper to get away. And they're just harassing him, heckling him. Everyone expects Jesus to pick up a stone and stone this leper because he was worthy of stoning. And you see Jesus, he doesn't crinkle up his nose. He doesn't shake his head and say, what you did was wrong. He doesn't pull back. He doesn't tell the leper to go away. But Jesus leans in and listens. Matthew 8 says, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately his leper was Leprosy was cleansed. A unclean, broken, washed up as this leper was, he knows that there is something about Jesus that makes him bold enough to approach Jesus. And notice he doesn't even make a request of Jesus. He says, Jesus, if you're willing, if you even have that desire, you can make me clean. 
It's a statement of hope and faith, and it's not an entitlement request. It's not saying, Jesus, you have to do this to, for me. It's just, Jesus, if you will, click me. Now think about all the things that Jesus could have done. He could have gone with the crowd's response and rid himself of the character. He could have expressed his sympathy and said, I'm sorry, friend. I don't know what to do. Um, I wish you luck and given him a few coins. He could have even had compassion on his condition and maybe just spoken a word and healed a man. But notice what Jesus does. He gets close to him. He leans into him. He touches him. When no one else wanted anything to do with him, Jesus touches him. Listen, it is ridiculous to think that a king today would have come anywhere near such a man. He'd have a leper killed, along with his entourage killed for allowing a leper to come that close to him. But Jesus is an accessible king to every single person, no matter how broken you are, no matter how messed up you are, no matter how destroyed you are, Jesus says, you can come to me. This is why when we read in Hebrews 4, we hear over and over that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And listen, friends, don't breeze over that. The fact that we can come boldly through the throne of grace isn't simply because you and I just have that right or privilege because of what we are. It is because of Jesus and what he's done. The fact that this morning you can pray to Jesus is because of his blood that has been spilled for you. The fact that you can, when you're in your greatest need, say, God, help, is because of Jesus and what he's done for you. Don't miss that the only reason we can go boldly before God is because Jesus is a king that's accessible, and because he died, he has now given us free reign to come anywhere, anytime, just as we are. And he hears and he listens. The leper proves that Jesus is accessible, and the Greeks in our text prove that Jesus is accessible. And it's even true of Jesus' disciples now. It wasn't too long ago that these disciples were the ones that wanted to send fire down from heaven and destroy the Samaritans. And these are the same disciples that wanted to run the children away. But look at them now. Look at how these disciples respond now. Verse 21, these Greeks come to Philip and ask him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip goes. He tells Andrew. Andrew and Philip together went and told Jesus. These Greeks grabbed a hold of Philip. They're like, hey, you're part of Jesus' crowd. You're part of Jesus' group. We want to see Jesus. We want to be introduced to Jesus, and we want to ask him questions. We want to know about him. We want to encounter him. And the idea of the text is they kept asking, like a child that's pulling on your jeans, asking for candy. That's what these Greeks are doing. They're begging, hey, can you please show us Jesus? And Andrew and Philip, this was classic for them. This is what they loved to do. They loved to introduce people to Jesus. They had a reputation of bringing people to Jesus. Philip is known as bringing Nathaniel to Jesus. Andrew brought his brother Peter to Jesus. Remember the miracle of the five loaves and two fishes? Andrew's the one that brought that little boy to Jesus. There was something about their countenance. There was something about their demeanor. There was something about how they lived their lives that made people say, hey, I want you to introduce me to Jesus. What about you? What about me? Do, do we live our lives in such a way that people say, I want to know the God you worship? Do we live our lives in such a way that, we, that people say, I want to know the God that you serve? Shared my testimony a couple of times, but the only reason I ever came to Jesus was there's a young girl in my high school who for I had to sit in homeroom with her for three years, and for three years, she drove me nuts because she was in love with Jesus, and I was running from Jesus. And there was everything about her was everything I wanted, but I didn't have. And finally, right before senior year, I just prayed one day and said, God, you either have to give me the joy and peace that she has, or you've got to get her out of my life because she's driving me nuts. And it was that weekend after I prayed that prayer that I finally surrendered my life to Jesus. That girl doesn't even know it. But the reason I'm standing here today is because her life 
radiated Jesus. Are you radiating Jesus in and through your lives? When your children see you, do they, radi- do they see Jesus? When your coworkers see you, do they see Jesus? Or do you have a reputation as someone that is so in love with Jesus? But you say, wait, I'm not accessible. I'm more of a private person. I don't like people. I've heard that from some of you before. Um, Notice that Philip and Andrew do this together. They don't do it by themselves. They were in community together. They needed each other. This is why we have community groups, because, because we need each other. Your faith wasn't meant to be done by yourself. It's to be shared. It's to be encouraging. It's in those moments when you're struggling, you have people around you, you could say, hey, I'm going through this rough patch. Would you pray with me? Would you encourage me? And it's not just for your encouragement, so you can be an encouragement to others. Because listen, each of us has been gifted and wired in unique ways, and if you are pulling out of community, you're hurting the body. You're struggling, and you're making the rest of us struggle because we need you. And so this is why we encourage you, be in community. Be in the community groups because you're part of the body. We don't want dead body parts. We don't want limp body parts. We need this together. So encourage you. Be in community. If community, one community group doesn't work out, find another community group to get in. If one Bible study doesn't work out, find another Bible study to get in. But don't say, hey, I'm just going to do this by myself because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting us. We need you in community. That was so off tangent. Um, number three. Jesus, Jesus is a savior king. Jesus is a savior king. Verse 23, Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus tells his disciples, he, the Greeks hear this, and no doubt the watching crowd hear this, and they hear something that they totally misconstrue. They thought that Jesus was going to be glorified before the Romans as the king. But when Jesus says the hour has come, Jesus is talking about his death, that he is going to die. Jesus being glorified means that he is about to go into the grave and be buried. But then in three days, he's going to come out of that grave resurrected. And he has defeated sin, death, hell, and Satan forever. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus' glory is not, he's saying, listen, my glory is not about trampling other people and destroying them, but my glory is going to be most seen when I'm trampled on myself. In order for a grain to be profitable, in order for a grain to be glorified, that grain has to die. A seed that falls onto the ground and resists the earth and refuses to yield will be of no value, but will be of no worth. There will be nothing to show for it. It has to germinate. It has to go into the ground. It has to break open. It has to die. It has to bear fruit. And Jesus is saying that he is not going to trample the Romans, and, but he's not, and he's not going to resist the plan of God, but rather he's going to yield himself to God's plan and uh, yield himself to the Romans and die. Because when he dies... You and I would be made alive. To conquer now, to defeat the Romans now, would be to remain alone. But to die now and break through death would be gain of millions of worshipers who are happy in Jesus forever, which is exactly what the Father says he's seeking in John chapter 4. Jesus was a saving king, not a conquering king, at least not this time around. And now he tells them what this means for them. He looks at the audience, he looks at his disciples, he says, listen, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servants will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor me, will honor him. Jesus tells him, listen, if you want to remain alone, if you want to do this by yourself, if you want to be effective, profitable, glorified, if you want to spend forever in community and not in isolation, then listen, you have to let go of your life. 
You've got to give it up. You have to die. And that term hate there really means to destroy or lose. And there's a couple words there for life, and they're different. The first word there has to deal with the person's makeup, their mind, their emotion, and their will. The last time the word life is used in that passage, it's talking about life, eternal, everlasting. It's about a quality of life. It's the idea of finding identity in your mind, emotions, and will, your personality. And if you do, you will lose it. And if you find your identity in what you own or what you possess or in yourself, ultimately you're going to lose it. You need a word from the outside. You cannot validate yourself. You'll fall apart without a word from the outside. To use a theological word, you cannot justify yourself. You can't justify yourself. Listen, the truth of justification by faith in Christ alone has to rock your soul. Otherwise, you will constantly be looking for approval and acceptance from anyone else and anything else in your life. You'll constantly say, if I can get this, then life will be happy. If I can have this, then life will be happy. If she likes me, life will be happy. And you'll constantly be looking for approval and identity in other people or other stuff instead of finding it in Jesus. It will send you into a search of another identity and you will build your life on what other people think about you. And listen, that will crush you. That will destroy you. You need to be justified by God through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. The cure to the narcissism of our culture is justification by faith in Jesus alone and knowing that God has accepted me, God has forgiven me. I can now live my life in boldness and confidence. It doesn't matter to me what you say or what you think. He has approved of me. That's the only thing that's going to cure the narcissism of our culture. And so Jesus is saying, listen, you have to give up control. You have to hand over the reins. You've got to raise the white flag. And in trying to rule your own life, what you're actually doing is you are destroying your own life. And you're losing it. Joy is only found in sacrifice. You can't come to Jesus and hold on to your own life. And you cannot progress as a Christian into the joy that he designed if you try to hold on to it yourself. Listen to these words from C.S. Lewis. He says, the more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. Our real selves are all waiting for us in him. It is no good trying to be myself without him. I am not in my natural state nearly so much of a person as I like to believe. It is only when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and when you do, you're going to find eternal life. Keep back nothing, nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred and loneliness and despair and rage and ruin and decay. But look for Jesus and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. But you say, but that's too hard. I'm always looking after myself and my interests. I can't break this cycle. And you're right. You're absolutely right. It is hard. In fact, it's impossible. We are so bent on our own independence and we are so selfish that we don't think that we need God in and of ourselves. His grace has to come to move us to surrender. Remember that we come boldly to the throne of what? To the throne of grace. It is grace that moves us to lose our life and to find it in Jesus. Listen, that only comes by looking at the story once again. You have to be melted by what Jesus has done. You can't look at this and walk out here thinking that you're just going to pick yourselves up by the bootstraps and enforce change on your life. 
You can't walk out of here and say, I'm going to just be more humble. I'm going to be more accessible. That doesn't work like that. You have to see that the change that happened in your life and the change that continues to happen in your life it only happens as you gaze at the cross of Jesus. Only happens when you see Jesus glorified, elevated. If you elevate yourself, you're going to see less of Jesus, but when you see when you elevate Jesus, you're going to see less of yourself. You need to elevate Jesus. You see, the crowd shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, and no doubt there was chills that went up Jesus' spine because what they were saying was, God, save the king. God, make the king victorious. But God wasn't going to save the king. God was going to let the king die. Not in his sleep, not with a quick assassination attempt, but he was going to die the most bloodiest, cruelest, most evil possible death, death on a cross in front of the entire watching world. And Jesus would enter the Garden of Gethsemane in just four days, and there he would plead with the Father, and he would say, Father, take this cup from me. If there's any other way for this to happen, if there's any other way for salvation to happen, let's go with plan B. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Jesus knew there was no other way. Sin couldn't be swept under the cosmic rug of the universe. The wages of sin is death, and either we would die or Jesus would die in our place. Only a completely innocent, perfect, blameless substitute could do that. Jesus had to go into the ground so that we could have salvation. And so you can imagine the scene, the sounds of the crowds shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God save the king going in and they're shouting, they're screaming, but Jesus is numbing all that out. This is this muddled noise for Jesus. The people's mouths and their hands are moving in slow motion in front of Jesus. You see, God is not going to save the king, but he's going to save us by letting the king die for you. They wanted a king with a sword, but what they got was a king with a cross. They wanted a king riding on a horse, but this was a king riding on a donkey in humility. In four days, the entire crowd would turn on Jesus. He would die, an unrecognizable, lonely, poor man. No one wanted anything to do with him. The Babylonian Gemara, the commentary on the Mishra, said that an officer offered for anyone to come to Jesus defense that an officer said hey if anyone could come and defend jesus you're welcome to but no one did everyone abandoned him everyone left him it was no wonder that when jesus entered the city he wasn't shouting sounds of victory but he was shedding tears of tears as he wept over jerusalem but friends death wouldn't be the end of jesus because Jesus would rise from the grave and he would be the Savior King who conquers the greatest enemies of sin, death, hell, and Satan. And listen, Jesus is coming again. And this time he's not riding humbly on a donkey, but he is going to be on a white war horse with a sword and tattoos on his thighs that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the entire world is going to be made right. Justice will be served and Jesus will reign. He will. And my friends, you have one of two options. You can either come to Jesus as a suffering servant or you will one day meet him as a conquering king. Because there's this thing in your life and my life called sin that Jesus does not take lightly. It is something that he does not tolerate. It is something that he will not sweep under the cosmic rug of the universe. It is something that he will not ignore but it is something that he will take on for you and take your penalty for you if you would just raise your hands and surrender to him would you lose your life today so that you could find it in jesus would you lose your life so that you could find true joy and happiness in him some of you have been running and running and trying to find your identity in people and what their opinions of you or possessions that you own or positions that you hold. And aren't you tired of running? Aren't you tired of trying to get approval from people by what you own and have and possess? Listen to the words of Jesus to you this morning. Come to me who are weary, who are tired, heavy laden. And if you come, I 
will give you rest. Aren't you tired of trying to make a name for yourself? Jesus says to you, come to me and I'll give you a new name and you will become a child of the king of the universe, the son and daughter of God. Aren't you tired of standing outside of the door of the kingdom? Jesus says that because of his grace, you can now boldly enter the throne room of grace and you can go to him and he will be a help in the time of need. Aren't you tired of wondering where he is, won't you come? Won't you come to his throne? As we respond to communion this morning, as we respond to God's living word, I'm going to invite you to spend some time meditating on the words, talking to God, reflecting, God, if there's areas of repentance in my life, would you call me to repentance? As you come and take communion, can I ask you, would you consider where your identity is really found in today? Is it really found in Jesus? Or is it found in something or someone or a title or something else? Where is your identity? Where do you find the most joy? Would you thank Jesus for coming in humility and not in power? Because if he came empowered, none of us would be here this morning. Thank him for going into the ground in order that you and I may have life. Can I invite you to reflect on Jesus and Philip and Andrew and how accessible they were? Is that true of you? Can people approach you? Do people see you as Jesus did, or do you just judge people? Are you connected with community? Are you plugged into community group with Bible studies? If not, why not? Why not? What's stopping you from being in community? Would you take communion to remembrance of Jesus' death? But also, would you take communion in anticipation of Jesus coming back as a resurrected, reigning, conquering king?